Dubstep may be a whole new world to you, or you might be one of the heads who's already deep into the sound. Either way, we're going to take you on a little tour and meet some of the key players in the most exciting new scene on the planet. I'm Marianne Hobbs. Come with us. Maybe you fell in love with the Burial album in 2007. Or perhaps it was Scream's massive midnight request line that changed your life in 2005. Or maybe you've been turned on to dubstep for the very first time by the Benger and Koki smash Night, which is all over the place at the moment. There's definitely something about the low-end bass frequencies of dubstep that's extremely contagious. I do like that deeper sound, that kind of meditational state, if you like, that can come from being in a dance and hearing really bass-driven music with a deep sonic edge to it. There's definitely a beyond to the dubstep thing. There's something about human nature as well, I think, that wants to transcend what is immediately in front of it or immediate necessity. That's what it taps into. You truly, truly, truly feel its physical presence, this militant ridiculous weighty bass you could kind of listen to it maybe in your yard or on your laptop and you're not going to really understand what it is but then when you go and hear it out in its true environment on a decent sound system then you're going to understand it and it's going to make you move whether or not you're wiling out or you know i mean arms up in the air you're going to be on some sort of rock to it Mala, producer and organiser of one of the scene's biggest dances, DMZ. His DJ and producer N-Type on what makes the sound so unique. N-Type. It basically brings underground music all into one place because of all the different influences. You can find one sort of style of the sound that you like and follow that. For instance, a distance track compared to a Mala track, right? Distance has got that kind of like heavy metal sound to it. And then you've got like Mala, he's got that kind of like slightly reggae sort of sound coming in there, but then also this techno y sort of vibe. They're two producers in the scene, but they sound totally different to each other. The dubstep scene had an early stronghold in Croydon, South London. Big Apple Records was the shop and the label behind some of the sound's first releases. Here's Arthur from the shop. Arthur, Big Apple. It's just getting to the point now where they're trying to kind of outweird each other with the sounds. That's when it gets exciting because it's kind of like a little bit of a competition. You know, I can come up with something madder than that. You know, I can come up with something more techno, or, you know, and it's great to see it because it's really pushing it along faster and faster and it's changing all the time Bingo. I like seeing what comes out of my head when I sit down to make a tune by the end of it Get I think done. to myself where did that come from No matter how diverse the sound, the one thing all the producers have in common is an insatiable appetite for sub-bass. Mala, digital mystics. A B-line can fill up a room. Sometimes when I hear bass lines, I actually see pictures as well, especially with loafer bass lines. <laughs> I always say that he writes like bass cannons because like a lot of his B lines, especially like Root, I always used to just see like this cannon, like a laser of just bass, just physical. So you'd feel it like tingling in your ear and then you'll feel it kind of like working its way down to your chest and it goes lower than the chest into your gut. Then you see that your, your, your trouser legs are kind of shaking and it's physically doing that for you. You can actually see it's going on. My dad come down to DMZ one time to check it out and he was there for about half hour 
and he was like, son, he goes, I didn't even have to dance. He goes, it was shaking me through and through anyway. Let's hear a few theories on what's so addictive about that lethal bass pressure. Mr. Lofa. Basically, each of your senses is, is hooked up to a gland and your hearing is linked to your adrenal gland. So when, for example, when you're walking down the street and you hear a loud crash behind you and you get a rush of a, like adrenaline, that's why you're being prepared for the fight or flight response. Sometimes other symptoms of a similar nature. I think a similar thing happens when you're bombarded with loud music. You get a rush of adrenaline because of the loud noise and that's what can give you energy for a night, I suppose. Writer and rave organiser Melissa Bradshaw. There's so much tedium in day-to-day life and especially, you know, currently in London, things are fast. You've got, you're buying all the time, you've got things in your face all the time, like, want this, want that, you've got to have this, you've got to have that. And it is escapism. It's, It's something really different and just takes you out of that to, like, another part of your being. There's things I've read in the past about ancient Egyptian like pyramids and stuff in the tombs where the wind would like kind of blow through all the passages and that and it would create like a low frequency which would cause it to have a certain presence, you know what I mean? It's like actually fills the air. Pinch, producer and founder of the Bristol dubstep label Tectonic Records. When we were in our mother's wombs you know, you're in this bag of jelly and all you can really hear is low-end frequencies. It's all that will travel through. And obviously in that period of development, you are without any needs. You're in perfect kind of harmony. The UK has a serious pedigree in pioneering underground dance music. Hardcore, jungle, drum and bass, UK garage. And it was from the ashes of the dark garage sound that dubstep began to emerge. Blogger and producer Martin Clark. Dubstep was basically born around 2000, 2001. And it was at the time when UK garage was collapsing under the weight of its kind of commercial pressures. And drum and bass had mutated from jungle and alienated a lot of its core fans. And a lot of people were really curious about this darker style of garage. And when the early dubstep records came out, they had all the kind of sexy swing that came with garage and the kind of influence of R&B and so on. But equally, they also fused for the very first time um, the dark sort of dread bass. And it was literally edgy, so it was not totally dark, but not totally light, this kind of sort of twilight sound that was dark and mesmerising. And for a lot of people, this was something that they'd been waiting for a very long time. Benny Hill of Horsepower Productions, one of the originators of the dubstep sound. Benny Hill. When we started, I guess you could call what we were making garage, really, and uh, we just made it in a different style to what other people were doing, just for originality, really, and people took up on that and decided, well, it ain't really garage, it's a different music, so that's how they coined the term in the first place. You know, they wanted to find uh, a good name to fit to the genre, I guess... Dubstep seems to have stuck. End time. I never really planned on like playing like anything that I'm playing now. I never really thought it would become dubstep or be a genre in itself. I grew up listening to like jungle and that was why I started DJing and I liked that kind of reggae dub sound which was in there so I started listening to reggae and then I started listening further out to other stuff like techno and house and all these different things. When I was originally playing some of the tunes, it was kind of like dark garage, like the LB kind of stand and stuff, and 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 like Get Benny Hill and, and and all that kind of stuff, which was more sort of like a dark version of garage, basically. And um, I, I, I like that because of the speed and the, the speed that you could either go mental and brock out to it, or like just like sit there and nod your head to it, or just do what you want. It's one of them musics where like the speed's just right. In 2001, the London Club Night Forward provided a platform for producers like Benny Hill, Orish J and Hatcher to play this more moody instrumental sound in the clubs for the very first time. DJ and producer Distance used to head down to Forward to pass out his early tunes to other DJs and hang out with a handful of people who were feeling those dark, sub-bass-driven sounds. I mean, I remember being at Forward when literally there'd be ten people there 
and it wasn't like it was one night it would be it was like that for a good six seven months you know 30 people turned up wow yeah it wasn't forward busy last night yeah wow but literally all they would do is that that box at the front of forwards everyone would just be resting on it with their elbows just looking at the dub plates just wanting to know what the next tune is mr pinch I went to forward for the first time with some friends heard code nine play and it was the first time I'd heard, you know, this kind of music in its absolute setting with a full weight sound system. Forward to darkened room with a few people kind of standing around and I remember walking in thinking, you know, what's what's going on here? There's, everyone's on the dance floor, no one's really moving that much though and it doesn't really make sense. But I just kind of got in there and after about an hour, you know, just lost the time and really fell in love with it. Dubstep is built to be played out on a great big dirty rig and if you head down to Subloaded in Bristol, Forward in Shore Ditch or Subdub in Leeds, all you'll find is a grimy room filled with giant speaker stacks. Getting the right rig together was crucial to Mala, Lofa and Koki when they set up their legendary night DMZ in Brixton, South London. A night which has become a mecca for fans of dubstep from all over the world. People travelling from the US, Japan, all over Europe and even Australia to meditate on bass weights. DMZ started on March 2005. It's an actual church, the building that still runs services there, you know what I mean? So it's just been a, a, a pleasure to be able to come in and kind of stain the walls with our uh, frequencies, you know. We don't want tonight. You kind of go up the stairs, a spiral staircase, and as you're going up the spiral staircase, you can, as you get more and more up, you just hear the bee line like more and more intensely, you know what I mean? And when you get to kind of like the top of the stairs, you can uh, start hearing all the highs and the tops and the snares and that. Martin Clark. I used to take drum and bass mates down to dubstep nights and they're just like, when is it going to go off? At DMZ people wait. They understand, they trust the DJs that the things will happen and that, that's a sort of delicious sense of sort of anticipation. So when, you know, a tune just really comes in, then it's, it's almost better because the previous tune wasn't just as big either, so it's a real contrast. DMZ went a rave up, you know what I mean? It started off as a small little dark space with a good sound system in there for people to experiment with frequencies and sounds and people would cut their dub plates on a Friday and they'd be playing at DMZ on a Saturday and that still goes on now. Distance. Some people look around and think, oh, people aren't feeling this, they're just standing there. But then the next day or whatever, the, the feedback is, oh my God, I was just in a zone. And I think that's the other thing about dubstep is people don't have to dance to it. Like they're happy to just be in this room where there's this amazing music. You're not forced to go there and think, all oh, right, yeah, well, I've got to just go completely off my nut and just dance like a madman. Because you haven't, you can just stand there. Even if you're at the front, you can just stand at the front and just be nodding and just enjoying the music. For Scream, it's a place to road test brand new tunes. It's one of the only clubs you get that sort of nerve thing. It's also really exciting to finish tunes for there, so it's normally the first club here to tune, you know. <laughs> Dub cutting, the process of cutting tracks onto dub plates, means producers can finish making a tune and play it out at a dance the very same night. And it's a ritual which has had a big part to play in driving the sound forward so rapidly and keeping it fresh. DJ and producer N-Type explains. The dub plate culture, it comes all the way back from like the reggae days really. Those guys were like making tunes and getting other people's tunes and basically taking them to a cutting place, a mastering studio. Um, I go to Transition Studios, that's in Forest Hill. Um, big up Jay and everyone down there. <laughs> Get that one in. Family, they're like my family down there. My name is Jason Goz. We are at my humble, let's call it my humble abode, Transition Mastering in South London. My name seems to be synonymous with dubstep. People have got this whole dub plate thing, kind of, they've got it all confused. It's as if, you know, a DJ's going to get a track, keep on dub plate for four years and not let anyone else have it. It's not really like that. For me, anyway, the dub plate culture thing is a simple matter of letting a track 
grow. Jason Transition, dub plate technician. I get the tunes sent to me on a CD from the producers, or I go around the house. Most of the time, it's me like driving about in my car, doing all, all mad mileage in, in my Audi, <laughs> going around everyone's houses, picking up the tunes on CD. And then once I get the tunes I like, I have a little listen through, take them to the cutting mastering place, and then Jason uh, or Leon, he master it. So what they do is they get all the levels right, get all the frequencies, everything, so it's like sounds perfect and it sounds good. We'll give him our opinion. Maybe you could do with a bit more bass. You could do with doing this on the vocal. You could do with doing that on the vocal. They'll take it away. They'll play it. Basically, a dub plate. You can play them probably about I don't know, 150 times maybe. Like what it is is it's like a, a kind of temporary record if you like. And it's about previewing and seeing how it sounds. When the track sounds right, the DJ will play that track for a little while and build a bit of momentum. And then he may give it to a few other people. Once he's got to the point where there's a bit of a buzz around the track. Then you'll have it mastered, and then we'll have some tracks in the shops. It's not really about just exclusivity, it's about building a track up. It kind of flies in the face of this whole download thing. A nice piece of honest vinyl, you know, it's got a life of its own. You have to go to the shop, you have to buy it. As I say, no one's really in this for the money, but the artists still have to earn some money in order to live. If we were in this for the money, we'd be plumbers. Now with so much music being consumed online, file sharing is being blamed by some people for killing underground music as it gets harder and harder for artists to earn a living. But many dubstep fans are taking a militant anti-piracy stance to protect the music they love. Distance. I think that's an amazing part of it. I mean, it kind of... Like, I feel very safe when I give my tunes out to people because I know they're not going to just have a friend around who's like, oh, yeah, I like distance or whatever. And they're like, oh, you know, well, like, you just give me this tune, here you go, you know, go and play it or whatever. I've had someone give me, like, a personal message saying, you know, I just thought I'd let you know that on this forum someone's got three of your tunes up for download. And I was just like, you know, oh, my God, this is, like, terrible, <laughs> you know. The fact that someone who's into the sound, they're like, you know, I'm, I'm just letting you know that it's there. It's just amazing, whereas before there wouldn't be, more than likely, he would tell everyone else on that forum, quick, you can come and get these, if it was drum and bass, it'd be, yeah, go to this forum, come and download this tune, and someone's put it up. Whereas in dubstep, they're like, you know, you've got to stop it, stop it now. Pinch. I don't think it's immune from file sharing and, you know, all this sort of thing. I don't think any kind of music is, but by and large, when you've got people playing things off dub plate, you know, that's an acetate, that's a piece of something that's in someone's bag. It's not a tune sitting on a hard drive in a in the wrong folder or a, a CD that can get left in a club. So the dub plates are kind of protected by themselves in a way, just by the nature of what they are. Generally, people are, you know, very supportive and respectful of what, what other people were doing and, and the music that's out there. That sense of respect and trust is found at every level in the dubstep community. Here's another of the boys behind DMZ, producer Lofa, on the family vibes. Uncle Lofa. That's one of the things about dubstep that makes it so special in a way, that there is no, no real attitude. The vibe is a good vibe and it's a friendly vibe. It's not over the top, it's not in your face friendly, but it's just relaxed and comfortable. I mean, for whatever reason that's there, that's one of the things that makes it makes it special makes people come again and again Get Sergeant Pokes host of DMZ and the best loved MC in the scene we're only really there for the one thing and that is to just hear the sound on a good system ideally so the community vibes and the community step is like is kind of what it was built on, man, I think. Part of this family vibe is down to the fact that Dubstep grew up and operates outside of the confines of the mainstream commercial music industry. DJ Chef. Everyone's got their role, you know, everyone's got their kind of part that they play and kind of help to push it in, in their own way. Like, everyone kind of clubs together to make it happen, you know. We don't need no support from, like, no major labels for nothing, you know, that. Like... We've always just done it ourselves, you know. From the early days when we was only selling like 200 units, 
or whatever, you know, it's always been like an independent thing. Pinch. I don't have a problem with commercial success. I just have a big problem with compromising ideas and sound. So the idea that possibly the sound could become very popular in its purer forms, great. You know, it's an appealing thought, but it's also pretty unlikely. Much in the way that Roots and dub music is still going and has survived years without any commercial interest by a few Trojan compilations here and there, but, you know, there's still a solid scene and you've got people who are involved with it because they're involved with a love of the music and that's why they're still doing it. That's why they cart in these huge, heavy sound systems around the country to clash each other at nights. It's because they want to do it. And I think as long as people are making music because they want to make it, it's going to sound good. In a time that's filled with gluttonous area and my pains to express this, your devious behavior, spend money, time, on a very last time, and the things you will only ever leave behind. The global dubstep scene is very much a product of the digital age. The sound's biggest meeting point on the web, dubstepforum.com, has played a major part. Here's Boom Noise, one of the site's moderators. Boom Noise. The old forum, dubplate.net forum, got shut down for whatever reason, and the scene was without a meeting point. You know, you had all these people over the world who loved dubstep, but they couldn't communicate or couldn't find out anything. And at that stage, there really wasn't much going on in terms of radio or international activity, international bookings. A lot of people around the world were relying on the forum to find out about the sound. So I even started up the forum, and it's really sort of spiralled since then. We started with something like, you know, a couple hundred members, which is just the old, old friends and family, and now we're sort of approaching 10,000 members, which is, which is ridiculous. Ivan, a.k.a. Dubway, who founded Dubstep Forum in his bedroom in Croatia. My idea was, like, to show the people that great music that is hidden somewhere in London. Maybe to people in London it doesn't seem hidden at all, but if you don't live in London, if you live somewhere else in the world, there is no way to see if it, if it is not present on the internet. So actually, the reason why I started the forum was to let the people know about the sound, about the music, about the great scene. Melissa Bradshaw. There has never been before, I don't think, and the drum and bass sort of, but not to the same extent, a music scene that was internet driven or internet based. So there's a whole community of people that know each other from online. It's not just the forums, but online radio stations and pirate radio that have been integral in pushing the sound. Martin Clark. Pirate and increasingly online radio are essential to dubstep because they're outside and independent of the mainstream music. But that means that the culture can be sustained long term and be built up and people can take risks and make mistakes and do interesting things and innovate really. N-Type has his own show on the pirate station Rinse FM. When you go to the Rinse studio you're looking at like a little secret location somewhere like but obviously like when everyone's on the decks and that vibe and <laughs> you can hear it down the, down the hallway or outside when you're pulling up. <laughs> Basically it was just a room inside a room so we go in there, come in through one door graffiti and all that stuff like everywhere you know that kind of vibe and then you've got like a half decent little studio like carpet on the walls a mixer which looked like it had been rinsed because everyone was <laughs> mashing it up I think every time everyone's vibing out it's just like playing in a dance really when you go to rinse it's kind of like playing in a dance horses galloping through the studio horse banger pots and pans Malon it is only fair to say that Rinse have, without a doubt, definitely been instrumental in supporting this sound. Scream. Well, it was the only place where you could get your tunes played, really, for a long time. Because nobody really wanted them in the clubs. They weren't the sort of more popular stuff other than Forward, but that still wasn't really rammed every week for a long time. So it was just sort of somewhere we get could dark. get get airplay easily. Easier than getting it on mainstream radio, I guess. But Radio 1's also had a big part to play in pushing the sound over the last few years. John Peel was actually the first person to play Digital Mystics on 
Radio 1. I remember getting a really, like, this email in 2004. It was just like, yeah, John Peel's been listening to some of your music. He really likes it. Would you mind sending some stuff? And I checked out the playlist and that, and he'd been playing some of my early records. So I remember sending him some music. See, someone like that, you know what I mean? The guy was, like, hardcore. He kind of told people what was going on rather than the other way around. This is Adult Sony by Digital Mystics, and hello to Mama out of uh, Digital Mystics. And Hamid says uh, good luck with uh, the job hunting. Dubstep had a meteoric rise in 2007, but 2008 looks set to be the biggest year yet as our UK dubstep soldiers continue their march across the planet. Boom noise. Something that's incredible about this sound is the fact that it started in Croydon, where there's virtually nothing going on, all these guys are motivated to make this music. Then it sort of transferred to Forward Club Night, where producers brought down their tracks, essentially just to play to other producers, their girlfriends and a few of their mates, and the crowd, it was empty. Now you've got Forward, it's absolutely ram jam pretty much every week, and at the same time, it's growing internationally as well. You've got Mada, you've got Scream, who've played in Australia, Japan, because Code Nine's played in Russia and China, and it's absolutely crazy. Sublo tentacles reaching around the globe. Lofa. Almost every week we're in a completely different country. I mean, there's, there's scenes everywhere in the world now. We've just got back from New York. We've been to Tel Aviv, Moscow, Slovenia, Holland, Spain, Portugal. Mala went to Japan. I've been really lucky. I've actually been to like 22 countries this year. And some of them places I've been like the first person to maybe go and play. The sound to people. Pinch. Sometimes people don't know what to make of it and they just kind of stand and look at you and look around and no one really knows how to dance to it so they don't and then it gets a bit uncomfortable and then sometimes you go through maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour of that and then you drop something that sets it into context and people sort of, yeah, you know, and then they look around and there's this positive feedback and yeah, when you switch a room that's the best feeling. The secret of the scene's success is that it's been fueled by a simple love of the sound and it's got its own unique and independent modus operandi. So what lies ahead for this furious and primal underground sound and the dubstep scene at large? Into the future, off our Big Apple crew. It's not something that you like to look at and plan, it's just do it and see what happens you know what I mean I like that that there isn't this kind of like that people aren't thinking right well we're going to get this we're going to sign this to the majors and then blah 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 no one's thinking that everyone's just thinking let's have a good party you know see how it goes dubstep pundit boom noise it's really hard to predict the future for dubstep I mean I think everyone's really quite scared of it going down the certain route of drum and bass and there's sort of a lot of people very active in trying to avoid that but at the same time as the music gets bigger and gets largely you know it does get more commercial there's more money involved and it's more exposed to certain things because we got into this thing because we love it we almost try and nurture it like it's our child isn't it we're like <laughs> don't anything to go wrong we're protective of our child Mala. I've been really inspired this year by the amount of places that I've been privileged to go and visit and play music and meet people. I'm really excited to hear some more music that's coming at the countries because I've been to a few places and there's some deadly, deadly producers that are making some really interesting stuff and not trying to mimic what's going on in London, but they're bringing their kind of soul and their spirit to it as well. I'm looking forward to spending more time in the studio, working with some artists and some musicians and some singers and that that I've been really lucky to meet this year on my travels. You know, putting on more parties, maybe putting on some in some random places, like doing something different. Lofa. People who are genuinely into dubstep, they kind of feel it's it's even that just people who just purely listen and come to the raves, they do feel like they own a part of it, which I think is a good thing. Because when I was young, I certainly felt like I owned a part of jungle, you know, even though I did nothing apart from listening, I definitely felt like it was it was part of me. Dubstep got where it was by people imagining how it could be, not what it is. And if you look at the guys, real innovators right now, they are people who are unconstrained by the term dubstep. They're just, they're just gone already. 
imagining what's possible, not what it already is or how it get should be. Eyes to the front, end tight. You can't really get bored. I don't think you could get bored really. It's like always evolving, always evolving. Don't forget to check the slideshow and the compendium that accompany this programme online all week. bbc.co.uk forward slash radio one. You'll also find a full track listing for the programme up there. One more time, bbc.co.uk forward slash radio one. Get darker.